Hey, Kevin Hester, it's this is Guy McPherson on Nature Bass Last Channel, and we wanted to have a conversation, a recorded conversation, so that other can, people can see what's going on in our beady little brains, maybe provide some positive input. So, I'm here in beautiful Bellows Falls, Vermont, in the U divided states of America, and Kevin is in Auckland, New Zealand, as I recall. Is that right? Uh, yeah, unusually for me. Normally I'm on Rakino Island in the Hauraki Gulf, but um, I'm having some grown-up time in the big city. <laughs> Once you got to be 25 or so, your mom let you do that. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I, have to, I have to spray CRC on my wallet when I go to the city so it doesn't squeak all the time when I open it. Uh, so we wanted to talk about the ongoing abrupt climate change and its impacts on marine systems, most notably the Great Barrier Reef, where you've been more than once. And I think you haven't been recently because you want to save your tears for another day. Is that about right? Yeah, that, that sums it up. Um, a few years ago, a scientist that um, I know uh, she called me on Skype and said that she was going to go and dive on the Great Barrier Reef and she was apprehensive. And then she called me back uh, a couple of days later and she couldn't stop crying. Talking about it. Wow. And she'd had a break from you, so you weren't the source yeah. of her tears. But this is an important part of the story, the grief of it. Uh, in the 2016 El Nino, the Great Barrier Reef got absolutely hammered in, a, in its worst bleaching event in history. And it takes about 15 years for, them, for a reef to recover from a bleaching event. So obviously it's never going to get a recovery time. But I noticed that a lot of the scientists who were interviewed about it, they were on the brink of tears. And they held them back. You know, there's a famous scientist that you and I follow, have been following for over a decade, Dr. Natalia Shakova. And when she was interviewed by Nick Breeze about the methane threat in the East Siberian Arctic shelf, she teared up. And that became a really focal point about, you know, people could see that she was visibly moved by the circumstances. And I think we should show that more. We're all grieving, you know, in this, what I've heard you call this grief denying culture. Right. Everyone's bottling it up and, you know, getting cancer and getting, um, getting the, the tears out of their system. Right. And in this culture, we are discouraged from the day we're born to not express negative emotions. You know, big boys don't cry. How many thousand times did I hear that when I was a kid? And so it's difficult to overcome those cultural barriers and actually act like human beings. One of the most important things I learned in taking the grief recovery workshop was that it's okay and that we should encourage other people to express their negative emotions as well. You know, everybody's happy for you when you express positive emotions. Yay. And then the way to keep those people happy is to never express negative emotions, to bottle it up, as you say. And that's not healthy in so many ways. I think it's also a bourgeois privilege. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Toxic positivity. It's become a science. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I hear very frequently that if I, if I just am more positive instead of being so negative, then I'll have a better life. Really? Really? Yeah, that's what, the, what some of the dinosaurs were saying to the other dinosaurs as they watched the, the um, meteorite coming. Oh, don't be so negative, Kevin. <laughs> yeah. Those dinosaurs had a bad day. Yeah. Our, our bad day is coming. You don't, you don't have to, it's not hard to see it. Just look up. Well, right. And even the IPCC admits that we are in the midst of an abrupt climate event. How abrupt? 
I'm going to I'm going to quote from their October 8th, 2018 report global warming of 1.5 degrees. Even abrupt geophysical events do not approach current rates of human driven change. What that means is the environmental change that happened that caused the dinosaurs to go extinct was not as rapid as what we're doing to the planet. That's amazing. You know, the coll collective power of humanity is truly astonishing. One report I saw said it, that we're emitting uh, the equivalent of seven uh, Hiroshima bombs of energy per second. Right. Yes. Uh, and a lot of people I know think that's a good thing. Look at how powerful we are. And see, people keep ignoring the lag between emissions and consequences. Right. A consensus that a lot of us have thought about, um, you know, since you and I have been talking about this together for over a decade, was that it takes somewhere between one and three decades for all the emissions to work their way through the system. But it's more complex than that. Huge pulses of carbon, i.e. entire forests burning, that can take centuries to work its way through the system. So the amount of lag and the, and the amount of heat that's in um, the pipeline already is phenomenal. Even James, Dr. James E. Henson, the grandfather of climate change, even he admits that 10 C is baked in with existing emissions and what he strangely called slow feedbacks. I, don't know. <laughs> I struggle with slow, slow feedbacks. Oh, yeah. Hanson, uh, it's really, really difficult to figure him out. You know, he called my idea of near-term human extinction crazy, in one word, crazy. And then he indicates that we're going to attack on 10C in the not-too-distant future, although he makes sure that that's beyond the lifetime of his grandchildren. <laughs> When we first started talking about this, the, the, the mainstream media were always referring to what, how bad it's going to be in 2100. Right. And then those goalposts got moved to 2050. So it's going to get really bad in 2050. The cognitive dissonance around this whole subject is phenomenal. We're, the, the whole culture is like a deer in the headlights. Right. And there's a paper that was published in 2016 in Global Geochemical Cycles, which is not exactly the National Enquirer. It's a peer-reviewed paper, a, peer, a renowned peer-reviewed journal. And that paper found that the ocean is well on its way to suffocating due to deoxygenation by 2030 by 2030. Well, that was like a kick in my guts. You know, and this is from 2016. That's from seven years ago. It ignores aerosol masking, of course, because nobody ever talks or writes about aerosol masking. It ignores self-reinforcing feedback loops, of which we've triggered many. Even the IPCC admits that we have triggered a self-reinforcing feedback loop which nobody talks about anymore, right? You never see the corporate media talk about abrupt or irreversible climate change, much less both in the same sentence. Since the Kyoto Protocol, we, all the NGOs were talking about how important it was for us to avoid tipping points. None of them ever mentioned that term anymore. It's right. just like Michael Mann and his hockey stick. You know, him and his, him and his colleagues came up with the theory, which I support 100%. But miraculously, Michael Mann can't see it anymore. Right. And he, he was the lead author on that paper published in 1990. He went on to have at least one child. And so he wrote about what became known as the hockey stick, the unbelievably rapid increase in global average temperature in 1990. And now he can't see it. He's, he's doing fine, it's, though. Yeah. It's phenomenal how the, the scientific reticence that 
is being shown everywhere. And people say, oh, you know, you guys are exaggerating. No, I think what it is is that so few people are prepared to put their hand up and say, we were wrong. We of underestimated course. climate sensitivity. And foremost among those people unable to raise their hands are academics. Academia depends upon you. To succeed in academia, you have to have an ego, a really serious ego. I know better than most people. That's how you succeed is because you have self-confidence that indicates you can get through this, whatever this is. And so, of course, academics have huge egos. That's what got them there. Yeah, I just can't, I just can't believe, though, that some that people like Michael Mann is prepared to look into the camera and bare-faced lie. Yeah, he's so used to, yes, he's so used to talking to a dumbed-down audience, and don't take offense, anyone, about what I mean by that, that he thinks that he can get away with it. The, the, he said recently, and he's reiterated it time and time again, so it wasn't as if it was a, a slip-up, he said that if we stop emissions, the warming will stop. Oh. And he's got to know about aerosol masking. He has to, or he's not a climate scientist. I recognize it's the best kept secret in climate science, but James Hansen has written and said many times that it'll take about five days for the aerosols to drop out of the atmosphere and contribute to very rapid warming. Five days. So you can't tell me we can stop emissions today and then in a week it's, it's going to be all better. It's going to be all cooled off. No. The latest work says 55% increase in global average temperature. That's huge. We're already at above two. As Andrew Glickson points out in his October 9th, 2020 book, The Event Horizon, in fact, I think it's the abstract for chapter five, which you can find online with ease. Look for the event horizon by Andrew Glickson. And you'll see that he writes, during the Anthropocene, greenhouse gas forcing has risen by more than 2.0 watts per meter squared, equivalent to more than two degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures. So we're beyond wow. two. And everything I see, uh, Sadly, I'm still on one social media channel, LinkedIn, which is allegedly the professional channel. And every day, about 10 times a day, I see somebody write that we have to hold it below 1.5 or we're in real trouble. <laughs> yeah, it's just so uh, um, ragingly dishonest to say that to the young people. Right. But, but this is where it inflames me the most. We. we We've got to deal with our grief and we've got to deal more importantly with their grief, but we can't deal with theirs if we're not confronting our own. Exactly. But to lie to them at this point, you know, I, I've got friends who I'd love dearly, whose children are going to university to study law and, and um, academic, you know, economics and bullshit like that. That reminds me, I have a video I'm going to release soon, next Monday, and it says something about economics, and it refers to economics as the dismal science. Have you ever heard that expression? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because, you know, I don't know how many people know that that's what economics is called, is the dismal science. It should be <laughs> called the dismal non-science or, or nonsense. Anyway. When you're talking about the aerosol masking effect, there's been a spectacular example of how potent it is that's unfolded this year. There's new regulations come in for shipping about what levels of bunker fuel they can use. And immediately after that, we had a, a, a spike, a sea surface temperature spike that I think is directly related to the, to the loss of those aerosols. Not only that, of course, it's only one more contributor to it, but there's no question in my mind. Out in the oceans, there's less pollution, more um, long wave radiation getting through and heating up the oceans. Right, and this is huge because the ocean is 
is basically a battery. That's where we're storing heat and greenhouse gases. And along comes the El Nino Southern Oscillation that's underway right now, that we know is underway. If it's a significant El Nino Southern Oscillation, we're going to break the temperature record by a long way since the Eocene. So that's a long time. That's before any civilization existed on this planet. The El Nino is really nice here. It's, it, the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia haven't completely committed. They're still on El Nino alert. Now, but the, the point I make with that is that people are saying that all this chaos is a result of the El Nino. No, it's not. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's just getting started. Yeah, we won't. We won't know the full effects of this El Nino until late or the end of the Southern Hemisphere summer. So I don't think we'll see the full effects of it until April, March, March, April, something like that. Right. So, you know, that's six months of broiling we've got ahead of us. Right. And that's the beginning of the growing season in the Northern Hemisphere. So... I would argue that that's just the beginning of the biological impact. So we have significant changes that show up in February, March, April, that's going to change everything about plant life and therefore animal life. Yes, yeah, so that, that, will, that will disrupt industrial civilization because we'll be fighting over who's going to get the last morsels of of food to eat so you know that's another reason why we're going to have another war because there's less food and the normal the normal process for dominant um civilizations is to take it from the neighbor right yes another reason for another war and another reason for me to be, eat more ice cream while i can i think that's what you're saying yeah yeah you didn't need to point that out everyone took that as a given <laughs> And now, yeah. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we respond because, you know, we still smile, we still laugh, we know what's coming. <clears throat> Edward Abbey, Southwestern American public speaker and writer, wrote The fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. And he died relatively young, by the way. He was younger than we are when he died. And he lived fully. Here was a, a human being who pursued adventure, the likes of which I almost never see. And I understand that a lot of people have commitments to other people in their lives. Once you have children, then maybe pursuing adventure becomes a little bit more difficult. And certainly most people I know are interested in pursuing a career a lot more than they're interested in pursuing adventure. But come on, folks, you only get one turn at this. This is not a dress rehearsal. It's so phenomenal for me when I hear people talking about their careers and, and their plans for the coming years, plural. My, I have to stop my eyes physically rolling around in my head when I'm listening to it because it, it, that comes across as being rude or arrogant or disrespectful or, you know, categorize it however you want. But I, I'm obliged to talk about it and mention it mm -hmm. because, you know, it, it's like watching someone walking towards a cliff, li listening to their favorite music and you don't want to disturb the song. Right. Yes. You know, it was until well, it was through the 60s and the early 1970s that medical doctors decided that th the ethical approach is to tell terminal patients that they're terminal. And the analogy is obvious. Climate scientists, media personalities, government officials, none of them are talking about abrupt, irreversible climate change. How could they not? It's clearly serving as an existential threat right now, 
the rate of change is happening too fast for vertebrates to keep up. We've known that for 15 years based on peer-reviewed literature. Mammals can't keep up either, and nobody talks about us being vertebrate mammals, and therefore we might not be able to keep up with the rate of environmental change. Uh. Fascinatingly, I have this conversation with my GP, my doctor. Mm -hmm. he, he occasionally calls me. There's something going on on the planet. Something's mm -hmm. being decimated, and he'll call me to talk about it. And when we, whenever I go to see him for you know, personal medical reasons, most of the conversation is about climate change. That's interesting. Yeah. I've, I've got a spine doctor that I rarely see because he's so busy. It's, he's really good. And he, the first time I mentioned, I don't, I don't talk about this, especially with people who I depend upon for my good health. Right? So I just avoid, but he kept badgering me. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Oh, you're a professor. What kind of professor? You're professor emeritus. What does that mean? Do you continue to teach? Blah, 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 blah. And finally, I just said what I do. You know, I talk about abrupt irreversible climate change <clears throat> and how it's going to kill us all in the not too distant future. And he just smiled and that was the end of the conversation. So I thought, well, maybe he already knows or maybe he just doesn't care, whatever. And then the next time I saw him in person, he brought it up again. And so I said it again. And he said he has children at home. And this is very disturbing. And surely I must be wrong. And on and on, you know. And I, I wanted to remain in touch with him so that we could have conversations that matter and talk about how he deals with how he informs or not his children. But the, the moment slipped away, as it often does with those folks. So if I have a chance to see him again, I'll be sure to harass him into putting up with me a little more, if he's willing. <laughs> I, I, you know, I've been talking about this with my doctor because I've been going to see him since before I, I knew you. And... Um, Early in the piece, he said to me, how are you handling um, the grief and the stress? And he said, have you ever had any suicidal um, ideas? And I joked back to him as I'm joking to anyone who's listening to this now. I said, no, not suicidal. I'm homicidal sometimes, but not suicidal. Right. I, I'm often asked how I don't get depressed. Why are you not depressed all the time? And I say, I don't have depression. I'm a carrier. <laughs> it's it's interesting you, you say that because, I, because I'm in town uh, for this couple of weeks. I've been catching up with friends. And two different people said to me, oh, you seem re in really good spirits. Mm -hmm. And, you well, know, considering what I study, um, most of my waking hours, it, it's true. But it's about my appreciation of everything now. Right. You know, there was no guarantee that any of us got to be here ever. The odds against any one of us being here, based on our knowledge of DNA and our knowledge of the universe, exceed the odds of plucking a single atom at random from the universe. So, and against those seemingly impossible odds, we get to be here. We get to be here in this most beautiful of planets. Yeah, so we get to see its demise, and and almost certainly ours. But but I think that a lot of people in our community who you know we've, we've been talking about this and and understand the precipice that is above and behind us that we've gone off. You know, I I I, I joke that what you and I are like now are like Thelma and Louise having a chat after going right. off the cliff. Right. But it's imperative for us to to maintain some, maintain some kind of balance between being immersed in the event and still getting on with living. That's a crucial part of what our message, what we're trying to convey to people. In fact, I would argue that they're one and the same. Understanding that our lives are short, no matter how long we live, our lives are still short because we're 
big vulnerable mammals, our lives are short. And understanding that and appreciating the moments we have, that goes hand in hand as far as I'm concerned with understanding abrupt irreversible climate change. I mean, exactly. Yes, we're all going to die. And it's interesting because most people realize they're going to die by the time they're 12 years old, right? I mean, I did. I knew I was going to die. It, it took me a long time to realize why I cried so much when my grandmother died. I barely knew her, right? We'd see her at most once a year for a few days. I didn't know this person, but I cried for a long time. And it took me a while to figure out that I wasn't crying for her. I didn't even know her. I was crying for me. I was 11 years old, and I realized that I am mortal too. And, and I think most people realize that by the time they're 12 or so. But then life just keeps getting in the way, right? So the career, the family, the, the getting on with our lives, it's in the way of understanding that our lives are short. Yeah, it's, it's the whole culture is so distorted that people get trapped in, the, in, in that old paradigm. You know, that's one of the things I want people to understand. We're in a new paradigm. And if, right. you, don't, if you don't think about it from that context, you're just going into a cul-de-sac. Right. When I was touring in Western Europe many years ago, I think it was 20. 15, um, the oldest human being at the time had just turned 117 years old. And when she was asked to think about those first 117 years of her life, she said, it seemed rather short. And we aren't going to make the odds against any of us here on the planet making it to 117 are exceedingly long. And even to her, it seemed rather short. I suspect it'll seem short to us too. And that's all the more reason to act as though the day we're here, to recognize that our time is short and to live accordingly, whatever that means. And, you know, no, no other generation has been confronted with this level of existential threat. We, they've all had some kind of, uh, you know, famine um, looming above their heads or war or a multitude of things. But life was going to go on in some way, shape or form. So for dealing with this when it's not, well, especially not involving us, there is no, there is no um, formula. To, we've got to work out a formula. We've got to come up with a strategy. Because there's no, we can't go back in time and look and see what strategy worked in this situation. It's too unique. Right. There's, there's no analog that seems reasonable. Although the ancient Stoics, many of them talked about existentialism. They talked about living each day as if it's our last, that sort of thing. But I strongly suspect, roughly 2,000 years ago, that very few of those individuals thought that next month or next year might be their last. It's far, a little hard to tell since they aren't here to have a conversation. <laughs> hey, let's get back to um, the, the climate itself and the convergence of the El Nino and what's going on around the planet. Mm -hmm. um, I saw a, a sea surface temperature off the coast of Florida that said it was 38 degrees C. Wow. It's spa pool temperatures. Right. Yes, I've been seeing lots of stories in the, even in the corporate media, this, the mainstream media, indicating that off the coast of Florida, it's too hot to comfortably swim, that sort of thing. That's amazing. This is well beyond what anybody alive today has witnessed. Years ago, um, Uli and I flew from New Zealand to Germany, where she came from, and we stopped in Dubai on the way. And um, I was feeling um, 
flush at the time in those old, those days when I was still earning money and had some. And um, I got a hotel right on the beach in Dubai. So I, you know, I thought oh, it would be just so cool to um, go for a swim in the ocean in front of the hotel. I got up to my knees and turned around and came back out and never went in. It was just too, you know, in New Zealand, you go into the ocean to refresh, right. to get out of the heat. And you couldn't do that in Dubai. No. And, you know, that's um, 15 or 18 years ago. Right. It's warmer now. I guarantee it. I think um, very close on the horizon, we're going to have Canfield Oceans. Absolutely. Uh, if, people, if people don't know what a Canfield Ocean is, have a quick look online. But it, it's an ocean that is nothing remotely like the ones that we have now. And we're already seeing the deep blue sea turning green. I've seen multiple reports about that. That's, that's a big change. Yeah, totally. Um, in, in, in our sailing community, if you're an ocean sailor, meaning you know, some going from one country to another, um, an ocean passage for the Royal Yacht Association is categorized as a, a trip over 300 miles from one, one country to another. And that's called blue ocean sailing. <laughs> so when I see my, my other colleagues who have, I've done offshore passages with, I'm going to say to them, um, green, green ocean sailing and see what kind of response <laughs> I get from them. Yeah, let me know how that turns out for you. <laughs> one, of the, one of the ways that I realized that things were changing so quickly was when I first started um, deliveries, I've done 16 ocean passages on small yachts. And in the early days, we would have flying fish that would, you'd hear a bang on the hull or a slap on the sails where they'd be flying past and hit the sails and they'd drop in the cockpit or on the, gun, the gunnels on the side of the boat. You'd run down and grab them quickly before they went overboard. It was the easiest fishing I've ever done in my life. But the reason I bring that up is uh, in my latter years of going to sea, I didn't see so many of them. And now when I have mates going up to the islands, I, especially, I, I ask them, can you do the survey for me? Can you keep a track of how many times you see flying fish? And some of them have come back and said, I didn't see one. Wow. And see, one of the problems with that is if you haven't seen it before, you don't know you've lost it. Right. Well, that's the thing about the shifting baseline, right? The, the marlins, that, the, the big fish that people used to catch off the coast of Florida in Ernest Hemingway's time were nine feet long. And now they're three feet long, but it took three or four generations to get there. So everybody thinks this little fish is now a big fish. The converse of that is uh, in New Zealand, I, I read this fantastic article in a... In a um, freshwater fishing magazine and it was about uh, catching trout and uh, it was not just about trout, it was also catching salmon in, in, in seawater as well in the oceans and what they said was that there was this great article and it was complaining that world records that were set in the 1920s and 30s and 40s and 50s have been decimated because people are catching fish just outside of fish farms. Uh -huh. And they're morbidly obese. Right. Because they're eating the food that's drifting out of the, the fish farm nets. Right. And some of these, one, one um, descriptor I saw is, said that they, they pulled in this massive trout and it didn't kick, it didn't fight. It was so obese, it couldn't put up a fight, which is phenomenal. If you catch big pelagic fish, mm -hmm. the fight they can put up is phenomenal. Right. I don't do that sort of thing anymore. You know, I stopped that long ago, but I remember I've, I've had fish on the end of a fishing rod for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the exciting part. Right. Yeah. I was coming into uh, Nukua Lofa in Tonga once and I hooked up a marlin. I hated it. You know, I did, it wasn't what I was trying to catch. I was trying to catch um, uh, tuna for eating. 
and I hooked the smile up, and I had a massive um, pen reel, and it just peeled about 400 meters of line off in seconds. Wow. The reel was literally smoking. It was phenomenal. Right. And, you know, those big pelagic fish have an incredibly important role in the, in the marine food web, and we specifically target them. Right. It's phenomenal. We target the, the um, mega f- uh, fauna and the tiniest little organism. You know, people go into health food shops and they buy krill oil. Right. The bottom of the food chain. Right. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of it is that people just don't know what we're we're sort of ingrained in this simplex, simplistic binary thinking. It's either this or it's that. It's zero or one. And nuance is lost on the whole culture, as nearly as I can tell. So they, somebody thinks they're doing one thing right, right? Like they buy an electric car or whatever. Then that absolves them of all other responsibility. <laughs> That gets back to the issue that um, this, this set of living arrangements, industrial civilization, is unsustainable, Absolutely. irrelevant about what the energy source is. Right. So all this talk about, and you know, I'm not criticizing people for getting an electric car or having a solar-powered home. I did all that. It's, this, people have to understand we're not criticizing their lifestyle. We're pointing out the reality of it. It's not right. a personal attack, folks. Right. It's, I, it's a scientific discussion, for pity's sake. Right. Yeah, when you find out the civilization is a heat engine, based on five peer-reviewed papers by Tim Garrett, and, and, and you want to live within civilization, right? Like, all of us want to be able to go to town, go to the city, buy our groceries at the grocery store, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the other side of that coin is you decide not to live within civilization, as I attempted to do for more than 10 years. And then that triggers our, the aerosol masking effect. Whoops. Right? So there's, no, there's clearly no one way to do this right, and certainly no way that's going to save the planet or even our species. I love, I love Henson's description of the aerosol masking effect being quote, our Faustian bargain. Right. That is absolutely, you know, if you've got any kind of philosophical bent in you at all, it's just, uh, it, it encompasses perfectly the, the catch 22 of that situation. Right. Absolutely. But remember, the idea is crazy. So let's have a talk about the collapse of the emperor penguin colonies in Antarctica. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and the consequences of it. Um, we've lost it. It's supposed to be winter in New Zealand. It's 7.30 in the morning here. It's warm. Should, it, it's a... Uh, it's about 10 degrees C outside and it should be a hell of a lot colder. Right. And we've lost this chunk of ice in the Antarctica, the same size as the un- not very United Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Another comparison I saw was it's about the same size as Argentina. Mm. Now what people don't understand is that how critically important that is in multitude of ways. You've got the latent heat component of it. All that cooling of that ice is now gone. And you've got on the bottom of the, those um, ice sheets was ecosystems. There's algae and the plankton and the krill and the whole myriad of, of species that require that habitat. So it's not just the emperor penguins on the surface. Right. That have lost their habitat. There's a hell of a lot 
of the marine complex marine food web that's been lost with it. And what will happen, we'll see, we won't see the consequences of that immediately. This is this whole um, snowball effect as it's rolling down the, the mountain. You know, you just can't see it, but it's building relentlessly every minute. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, as you indicated, it's not just the penguins. The penguins are the highly visible species that we can relate to as humans. They're cute and all that, but they're also emblematic of far more important things going on than just losing a penguin or two. Um, the, the species that predate on them, like orca and different wh other whales that are um, carnivorous, they, what happens with the eating of those penguins is that a whole lot of nutrients are recycled through the, the water column. The, the orca eat them, digest them, and defecate them. And that is that cycle that we are losing. People don't seem to grasp how interconnected every single piece of the ecosystem is. Nothing functions on its own. Right. And it's something very difficult for most people to understand because we've been well taken care of by the set of living arrangements, right? We, we can pursue a relatively simple life with no nuance. We just go to the store and get the groceries and bring them home, cook them on a stove using natural gas or electricity generated by coal. And it just goes on and on. And, you know, to try to convince somebody that our ability to do these things that we consider simple depend upon so many complex interactions. It's just hard to grasp. We've set, led such simple lives because we've been raised like children by this set of living arrangements. And that predominantly uh, is true for urban people and mm -hmm. less so for rural people Absolutely. or seafaring people. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. So self-reliance is not something that most people know anything about because well over half the people in the world now live in cities and in overdeveloped countries like the United States, Great Britain, France, and so on, it's considerably higher proportion than that. So of course, nobody knows how to do anything. James Lovelock has talked about that, how we're disconnected from the natural world to the extent that we're losing species that we never even knew existed. Right. Most people don't, if they go outdoors, it's only as a quick bypass to get where they're going to another indoors place. <laughs> Our, our friend and colleague, Paul Ehrlich, described us as um, soaring off the limb right. of, uh, of existence. And, on, and we're sitting on the limb that we're soaring off. So yeah. uh, I, I butchered that, but you get the, uh, the, the drift. Yes, absolutely. And most people don't even know. And how could they? You know, you, you grow up in this set of living arrangements. Everybody's told to do the same thing. You don't even have to be told. You just look around. Everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody goes to school and they go to school some more. You fall in love. You get married. You raise 2.5 children. You work until you, you're too tired and old to work anymore. Then you collapse into a heap and start drawing your retirement money. It's all the same. I'm, ha I'm having that conversation with people where... I'm saying to people, stop working. And they go, oh, no, no, you know, I, I don't want to erode my capital. But I'm trying to explain to them that money will have no value very soon. So it doesn't matter about, you know, of course, you've got to prepare and make sure you've got food on the table and a roof over your head. But so many of the people that I know, don't, they have all that guaranteed, but they're so stuck on the hamster wheel that they can't conceive of have, letting their net worth decline. No, they, there's this obsession with more, 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 more. And 
we're losing this opportunity to make the very best of time of the time we have left. Absolutely. I want to bring up a subject about, you know, all the coral reefs in the world are in danger at the moment mm -hmm. because of sea surface temperatures. But I want to bring up a subject. I, I first dived the Great Barrier Reef in 2001. I skipped a 37-foot yacht from Micronesia to Cairns, and then we sailed 800 miles down the Great Barrier Reef, diving every day for six weeks before I sailed the boat back to New Zealand. At the time, a marine biologist in Cairns conducted a seminar that I attended, and he said that the reef had only one generation of life left in it. This is a 2001 story, okay? You just get where I'm going? Yes. His own, <coughs> excuse me. His own, <coughs> excuse me. His opening gambit in the uh, lecture was, quote, turn to the person sitting beside you, pat them on the back, and congratulate them for being the last generation to dive the Great Barrier Reef before it dies. Wow. I guess he nailed that one. I sat there thinking he's exaggerating. Right. And then I thought, is he exaggerating for impact? So I'm, you know, I'm drilling down thinking, well, why would he say that? And it turns out his timing was almost exactly right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Had it not I, been for lots of aerosol masking between then and now, he would have been exactly right. Yeah. Uh, that's what we do best. So, okay, so now we, we, we've come to the conclusion that the oceans are an incredible danger from what we've done to them. Like you say, it's like a battery that's overcharged and it started fuming. So you'd think, with all that knowledge that we have, we would look for ways to mitigate, right? And instead of mitigating, the, the most horrendous thing that I've seen industrial civilization do in recent times is unfolding in, off the coast of Japan, where Tetco, and the Japanese government have take, decided after very deep analysis of all their options, they chose the cheapest one. Right. And that was to dump the water, the radioactive sludge that they're calling filtered water, they're dumping it in the Pacific. They've already started. Um, if I start crying while I talk about this, you'll just have to bear with me because this has been a, a subject that's been dear to my heart since I was a, a kid. So they're dumping this radioactive water off the coast of Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to think, like them, you know, theoretically, what we could do with that water. And I'm going to bring the subject up, and I'd love feedback, A, from you, but also from anyone who listens to this to see if what they think about my proposal for that radioactive water. I thought, why not pump it into an oil tanker, right? And then go to a depleted oil well mm -hmm. that's been capped. Mm -hmm. and pump the irradiated water down into an empty oil well. Now, I'm not saying it's a good thing. Of right. course not. Vomiting the stuff anywhere into Gaia is, a, is an a, appalling thing to do. But we have to come up with some kind of solution or some kind of strategy, an interim strategy. And... I think that would work. If anyone um, can get back to me and tell me why it what wouldn't work, I'd love to hear it. But I think the only reason why they haven't pursued it is it would be the most expensive option. I'm 100% sure this is an economic decision. Yes, it certainly would be expensive as opposed to just throwing it into the ocean now more than 12 years after Fukushima Daiichi had its little problem. And also another aspect about that 
is it is a little bit of a diversion, all that um, stored water, mm -hmm. because that's just what they're able to catch. Right. Those three nuclear plants were, were built at the foot of the mountain range on the coast, and the, the, there's a lot of um, subsurface, subsurface water, and that will be flowing over those exposed coriums that are being that escape primary and secondary containment. So there's a hell of a lot going out with completely separate from TEPCO. They're, they're only discharging the water they used. Right. Yes, absolutely. It's reminiscent of Garrett Hardin, best known to most people for his essay in science about <laughs> I just lost it. Okay, well, I'll, 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 um, I'll bring up uh, another subject and you, that'll come back to you in a second. Uh, I want to talk about um, the corporate media's narrative control of where we're at and, and uh, what the situation is. And the, the Guardian, who a lot of people... Uh, wax lyrical about how good the coverage on The Guardian is, and they seem to miss that it's still just the edit, edited highlights. So Guardian have pu just uh, published an adult article titled, quote, Off the Charts Records, Has Humanity Finally Broken the Climate? Okay, so that sounds like, oh, okay, they're getting to the heart of, heart of the matter, and this is going to make you laugh. Okay, here's a quote from the article. Quote, the issue is being struck. Uh, the record shattering heat waves, wildfires, floods, destroying lives in Europe, USA, India, China, and beyond in 2023 have raised an alarming question. Have humanity's relentless carbon emissions finally pushed the climate crisis into a new accelerating phase of destruction? Okay, so that's sort of pretty uh, high powered hitting sort of uh, approach. So. Yes, for people only looking at this occasionally or, or superficially, it sounds like it's being covered. But here, here's the bit that's going to make you laugh. Quote, the issue has been strongly debated with accusations of doom-mongering being countered with, char char with charges of complacency. The answer matters. How bad is it? And how can we limit the damage? <laughs> to find out, the Guardian asked 45 leading clim climate scientists from around the world who asked the equally vital question of whether extreme events were hitting people faster and harder than expected. And then they go on to say that, that these scientists said there's still, the 45 of them all agreed that there's still time to fix this if we of course just there is. Act of course there is. Now. Never mind that the IPCC admitted Okay, first a little backdrop. The IPCC was designed to fail, as pointed out by Michael Oppenheimer on the Environmental Defense Fund blog many years ago, 2007. And despite that, despite that, the IPCC has concluded we're in the midst of the most abrupt event in planetary history, and also that climate change is irreversible. And all I ever hear when I say those words is I'm a terrible person, right? I'm discouraging people from taking real action. N nobody's chasing down the members of the IPCC who wrote those papers, saying terrible things about them. Uh, and you've got, you got to remember that that's as diluted a perspective as possible because of the nature of the IPCC. So for them, to not be able to conceal that shows how far off the cliff we've gone. Right. So yeah. it's all about narrative control now, from, from now until the lights go out. So I want everyone to question what you and I are saying. And if people can come back and refute what we're talking about, boom, come on, bring it on you people. I'm up for yes. it. I want it. Yes, absolutely. I have zero interest in being proven right. So Michael Oppenheimer was at Princeton, a Princeton professor, when he wrote that blog piece. It's called How the IPCC Got Started. And I think it's from February 1st, 2007. It's from 2007 in any event. 
And finally, I remember Garrett Hardin was famous for his essay on science on the tragedy of the commons. That's what he's best known for. But amongst ecologists, he is also well known for his question. When, when pondering any action of significance, particularly at the municipal or societal level, he suggested we ask, and then what? So every ecologist knows that Garrett Hardin is responsible for asking that question. Okay, so we decide to throw the water from Fukushima into the ocean, and then what? We decide that we're gonna stop the water from flowing down over, over land and flushing out that water into the ocean, and then what? You know, there's, you can ask that a thousand times and pretty soon you're like the five-year-old who asks why all the time. But it's a reasonable, legitimate question to ask when we're undertaking significant societal action. I am that five-year-old. I'm annoying. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the kinds of questions that had people been asking for a long time, I think we could have delayed this mess a little bit longer. Maybe, maybe forever. I want to talk about how these kind of events, like this decimation in the Antarctic with the, the penguins and all of the attacks on the Great Barrier Reef, the, the whole marine ecosystem. When a really big thing, like for say, if the Great Barrier Reef gets wiped out this summer, which I think is a very high possibility. All faith in this set of living arrangements will just evaporate. Right. Conf capitalism and industrial civilization is a confidence game. Absolutely. So I, I really think that we could see a complete and utter crash triggered by something like that, whether it is a... Um, the death of the largest living single living organism on the planet, which is the Great Barrier Reef is, or whether when we leave, lose a city to people hitting their wet bulb temperatures, already people are, are places in the Middle East are having this situation. Kuwait had it recently, Iran, Iran shut the country down for a couple of days. They told everyone to go home. You wouldn't get, the, you wouldn't get that in the United States or in the United Kingdom, I can assure you that that they'll tell the workers to go home. But they did that in Iran. But what I think will happen is sooner or later, in one of these heat waves, the electrical infrastructure will fail. Mm -hmm. And for the benefit of anyone who doesn't know, I have, uh, uh, I used to have full, full re um, registration as an elect electrician in New Zealand, and I have a high voltage switching and protection qualification from the London Electricity Board. So I know a little bit about elect electrical transmission. And as you heat up the conductors, their resistance increases and their efficiency decreases. And you get a lot of overloading and a lot of heat. <laughs> There's your heat machine again. So yeah. I think what we could see is we lose a big city to a power outage, no air con, wet bulb temperatures, and a mass, mass die-off. And that will just reverberate around the globe. <clears throat> Everyone will soon realize that this is our future. Right. Well, I don't see how capitalism can jury me into that. You can't print your way, you can't 3D print your way out of abrupt climate change. No. And by the way, when this set of living arrangements goes away because of the loss of aerosol masking, we're done. There's then shortly thereafter, there's no habitat for humans on this planet. So people from Idle No More and Dumb Green Resistance and so on, who think that it's a good thing to terminate civilization are either ignorant or just mean-spirited. I'm not sure which. I think they're so boots and all committed into their mission. And you've got to remember in the back of all this, these people had the right intentions. There's nothing wrong with their intention but they're not prepared to deal with the new paradigm. Right. You know, when a ship starts sinking, it's, it's the, the people with the best skills who become the captain or the, or the leader. 
if, if the captain freaks out and jumps in the first life raft and disappears or goes down to his cabin and cries, it's up to other people to face whatever is happening and, and whatever you're going to do about it. I wrote a, an article a few weeks ago about the, the class struggle on the Titanic as it sank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And about what I would have done if I'd have been the skipper of the Titanic after we hit that iceberg, I would have sent the crew down to unlock all the doors to steerage class and get all those working class people up and talk about, okay, the ship's sinking, what can we do? And what I would have done, I would have got all the trades people and all the, the, anyone who was fit and healthy and strong and I would have started launching the lifeboats and making a raft mm -hmm. using all the ropes, the, the cushions, everything that was in first class, you know, the, the drapes, the, the, the ropes for the drapes. There was a whole lot of infrastructure that you could have quick. And they had a lot of time when the Titanic sunk. It was flat, calm seas. There was plenty of time to come up with a strategy. But the class war kicked in. The ruling class in first class wanted the lifeboats. They didn't want to share them with the proletariat. And this is where we're at now. You know, people, it's the same thing. If, right. People say, oh, uh, you guys are exaggerating. No one in Somalia will say that you're exaggerating. Right, exactly. It's or all about white privilege and privilege generally. Yes, indeed. I think right there is a convenient place to leave it.